Well, greetings, uh, test takers. This is Dean Tenney coming to you from my studio in fabulous Las Vegas with another installment of a uh, series exams in 60 minutes. Uh, we had requests from test takers about, you know, what video should they watch the night or day before their exam or morning of their exam. And, uh, you know, they had chosen some uh, favorite videos. I'll link to some of the popular, the most popular video uh, that people were using for that. Anyways, I gave it some thought that, well, maybe we should just make 60 minute overviews that people could be uh, using for that as an hour they could listen as an audio, which was people were doing in their commute to the exam site or just to kind of do a last minute kind of intellectual inventory. So if you're not testing in the next day or two or uh, tomorrow or this afternoon, then save this, save this uh, video for when that uh, time comes. Okay, so let's uh, get started in this uh, 60 minute review. Let me turn over my egg timer, a uh, real challenge. You know, so again, this is not a learning tool. It's to get you in the flow, the chi of your uh, NASA exam. All right. So under the Uniform Securities Act, uh, remember all registrations of persons. And remember, persons mean natural persons, living, breathing human beings, investment advisor reps, but also unnatural persons, uh, broker dealers and investment advisors of the firms. All those registrations uh, expire on December 31st. Uh, the, you know, not an exception because it's different. Securities are different. The registration for security is effective for one year. So uh, persons, the registration of the persons, December 31st. For securities, it would be uh, 12 months. A uh, successor firm. Remember, a successor firm to either broker dealer, but the one shows up on the test is an investment advisory firm, uh, does not have to pay additional fees until the renewal date. Uh, all securities professionals natural and unnatural persons have what's called consent to service. Remember, consent to service is a permanent part of your record. It allows the state administrator to receive uh, legal documents uh, on your behalf. It's a permanent uh, part of your record. Uh, if a, a broker dealer, broker dealers have net worth requirements, net capital standards, and those are not subject to the state, meaning the state can't impose upon a broker dealer a higher net capital standard than it has already or it's a, you know, SEC registration, um, you know, in FINRA, there are two regulars of broker dealers. Now, if a broker dealer, remember, has an office in the state, end of question, they're going to have to register in the state. Now, there are some people that are not considered persons legally, where those would be minors, uh, people declared legally incompetent, and um, uh, dead persons. None of those are persons under the Uniform Securities Act. If uh, you have as an investment advisor uh, discretion and all you have is discretion, you can make a decision about action, asset, amount. You don't have custody. The uh, Uniform Securities Act template would have a net worth requirement of $10,000. If you have custody, it would be $35,000. And the investment advisory firm can uh, post a surety bond uh, in lieu of that. Uh, there are two nasty words we never use. We never use the word approve, and we never use the word guarantee. So if we're going to use the word guarantee, we better make it very clear to the investor in what circumstance that word is being used, used. typically like a treasury security, perhaps, or a parent company, making sure that they understand the parent company's uh, guarantee of the subsidiary's debt is only as good as the parent company, right? The guarantee is only good as the guarantor. But for the main test purposes, we don't use the word guarantee as it relates to securities. If you wanted to hear the word guarantee, you need to talk to a banker about a banking product or an insurance agent about an insurance uh, product. Uh, there are uh, exempt transactions under the Uniform Securities Act, isolated non-issuer transactions. Isolated is one of those pivot words on your exam uh, this afternoon or uh, tomorrow. Uh, transactions with institutions, uh, unsolicited orders, where it's a customer's idea, transactions between the issuer and the underwriter, transactions by fiduciaries, sheriffs, the state administrator, the uh, trustee in a bankruptcy, and then private placements are exempt transactions on the Uniform Securities Act. Remember, that's 10 or fewer offers to non-institutional customers within uh, 12 months. If the security or transaction is exempt, it doesn't matter. Remember, no matter what scenario they give you, the BD and its associated person must be properly uh, registered. Now, under the Uniform Securities Act, 
when an agent terminates association with a broker dealer, both the agent, you know, for most of you, that's year six, year seven, uh, would be responsible to notify the uh, state administrator. Under the Uniform Securities Act, if the investment advisor uh, representative leaves the investment advisory uh, notification, it depends on whether the investment advisory firm was federally covered or state covered. If state registered, only the investment advisors notifies the administrator. If uh, federally covered, uh, then uh, the IAR, the investment advisor rep, that would be you on the exam, uh, would notify the administrator. Uh, as we said, there's no such thing as an individual who's representing a bro broker dealer that does not need to be registered as an agent uh, of that broker dealer, must be registered. So don't get you know hung up on what comes after if they're asking about whether the agent needs to be registered. In all circumstances, the default should be uh, uh, yes. Uh, can you split commissions with other agents of your firm? Yes, and you do not have to disclose that, how you're splitting the commission uh, with the customer. I mean, the commission is the commission, and how we backstage split it up does not need to be uh, dis discussed. Uh, Snowbird uh, rule provides an exemption for registration of all securities professionals who deal with vacationing clients. Uh, that's subject to a 30-day rule for a change of residence, right? So if the snowbird decides they're not going to be a snowbird anymore and they're actually moving to that state, well, then we would have 30 days to get properly registered. Uh, you always uh, give com uh, customer complaints promptly for your uh, to your supervisor. Uh, a re a an agent may accept, remember, an unsolicited order for non-exempt unregistered security in an exempt transaction. Wow, remember, get careful with that language. So what that's saying is, if a customer, for example, you know, calls the broker dealer and it's their idea to buy or sell some security like some crazy penny stock, that's not going to be a problem. Um, record keeping. Uh, record keeping uh, for a uh, broker dealer. The vast majority of broker dealer records are uh, three-year records. There's very few that are lifetime and six. And I wouldn't worry about that on your uh, NASA exam, you know, kind of beyond uh, your pay grade. Uh, correspondence and uh, social media, uh, over and over and over again, state administrators have said they make no distinction between the method of distribution and what the rules are about, uh, you know, doing this. What the rule basically, what you're gonna get tested on is every firm has to have written supervisory procedures about what is acceptable or unacceptable and use of uh, their uh, agents or investment advisor representatives' uh, use of social media. Uh, margin accounts. Remember, if you're opening an account, a margin account on behalf of your customer as an investment advisor rep, that broker dealer is going to want a credit agreement, an hypothecation agreement, which are mandatory. Hypothecation, where the customer is pledging securities as collateral for the loan. Remember, if I am a lender accepting securities as collateral, and you don't fulfill your responsibilities and I sell you out, that is not a problem. So I don't have to worry about running afoul as a lender uh, selling securities that have been pledged as collateral, whether they've ever been registered or not. Uh, we have to give you a risk disclosure document under NASA, Statement of Ethical Policy, right? Telling you that uh, trading on margin is hazardous to your uh, financial, financial health. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Uh, definitely would know the right of rescission. So, you know, if we didn't properly blue sky the security, you know, we shouldn't have coordinated and we didn't, we should have qualified and we didn't, then what we can offer the investor is the right of rescission. And the right of rescission is where I tell the investor they have 30 days to rescind the sale, get back their principal and interest, or if they choose to, uh, they can go ahead and uh, keep uh, that security. Uh, remember this idea of consideration or not. What I mean by that is, you know, if there's a stock split or a stock dividend and there's no payment, that's typically not going to be an offer or a sale uh, on your exam. Uh, you might encounter uh, a question or two about types of orders. The vast majority of orders is going to be, uh, you know, market orders or limit orders, but uh, I'd be prepared for a, a question about stop order. We call them stop orders because they're used to stop losses and securities uh, uh, positions. But also remember, you know, it's always based on context. So another thing to know is that a stop order from the administrator is much different, right? That's where they're saying, 
you know, stop the registration process. So make sure, you know, on your exam uh, today or tomorrow, you're just reading it once for context and saying, okay, is this about a, a stop order for a customer trying to stop a loss, or this is this a stop order from an administrator telling me to stop the registration pr process? And they can do that on a uh, summary basis. Summary means times of the essence. And so if the state administrator takes action, you can re request a hearing and you would have that within 15 days. Now, the maximum criminal penalty on the Uniform Securities Act is $5,000, up to $5,000. And the maximum uh, imprisonment is three. That would be go to state prison. Now, uh, again, we're focused on the state because that's more likely what you're going to experience on your exam. Okay, so uh, federal and state registration of investment advisors and investment advisor reps. So remember, we created this uh, two baskets under the National Securities Market Improvement Act, federally covered securities and federally covered investment advisors. You know, federally covered investment advisors are those that have assets under management of 100 million or more. 100 million to 110, they can choose who they're, uh, you know, going to answer to, who they're going to register with. And I don't know of anybody who would choose not to be with 100 million federally covered. And once they're federally covered, there's a floor at 90. They can go down to 90 in assets under management where they could get kicked back uh, to the state. So, you know, 100 to 110, you can choose whether to register your investment advisory firm with the feds or the state. Uh, 110 is fed, and then below 90 is where that floor is. Uh, remember your memory aid device. I wish there were more memory aids than there is. But remember, if your investment advice pivot word is incidental, and you're a lawyer, you're an accountant, you're a teacher, you're an engineer, well, then you're not an investment advisor and don't need to be registered as such. Now, remember, once the, the fee goes past incidental, then you're definitely going to uh, have to uh, register. I uh, Remember, if you go get cle clever, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so if you call yourself financial planner, investment counselor, you know, whatever you call yourself, you're still subject to, to the rules. Remember, the big thing for tomorrow or this afternoon is ABC. ABC, do you give investment advice? Do you tell people you're in the business of giving investment advice? And do you tell people you want compensation for uh, doing so? All right, we talked about, I think, already briefly, if you're a state-covered investment advisor and you have discretion, your net worth requirement is 10. And if you maintain custody of funds and securities, then your net worth requirement is 35. Again, we're talking about the Uniform Securities Act. If there is a testable distinction, I'll, I'll try and make note of it, but you know they don't test you too much on whose rule it is, just know the rules. And there are way more questions about the Uniform Securities Act. Uh, remember, you can post a surety bond instead if you'd like. Uh, if you are an investment advisor and you're offering free services, like a portfolio review, for example, uh, indeed, that has to be totally free of any obligations. If you're going to give your past performance, this is a choice. I don't have to tell you, you know, to refer to my past performance. But if I do, I have to give you the entire universe of my selections for a minimum of uh, 12 months. If I'm going to use any charts or illustrations, I, tell you, I have to tell you the difficulty on using those, the challenge in doing so. Uh, remember, if I'm going to use third-party research, very important. If I'm using third-party uh, research, I have to give attribution. I can't make it appear as though I'm the one who generated that uh, that um, product. You know, I want you to think I'm smart instead of somebody else. Uh, if it's used uh, for the basis, uh, you know, I don't share it with you, but rather I just use it backstage. I don't have to disclose that uh, to you. Uh, remember comp client confidentiality. I'm never going to diver uh, divulge customer confidentiality unless I have your permission, and I say, hey, can I tell somebody I manage money for you? Now, the exception on your test tomorrow or this afternoon is if it's the government, the IRS or somebody like that who wants your information, well, then certainly I'm going to go ahead and uh, give them. Now, remember, if I'm going to have performance-based uh, compensation, uh, my investor is going to have to have a minimum net worth requirement or a certain number of assets under management. They won't actually get the number. Uh, you know, presently, who knows, videos live forever. For your notification, it's assets under management, a million or net worth at 2.1. I wouldn't worry about that at all on your exam uh, this afternoon or tomorrow. Uh, whatever fees you do charge have to be competitive. Yeah, it's going to be considered unreasonably, uh, considered unreasonable if the fee is projected to consistently be more 
than the expected return of the portfolio. So, you know, you know, you know, if I know that I'm charging a fee that will result in it not being economic of our relationship, I'm going to be in trouble for that. Um, agency cross transactions. Uh, you know, that's where the investment advisory firm receives, uh, represents both the buy side and the sell side and receives a, a commission on uh, both sides of that. Uh, we're not supposed to recommend both sides to the trade, right? So in an agency cross, you know, agency is an important word. I mean, it's not inventory. It's just instead of taking the order to the market maker, you know, the bid's 15, the ass is 16, I'm going to cross it at 15.50. Uh, if I'm going using, if I'm actually a broker on account and the transaction is going through my broker dealer and I'm receiving additional compensation for that, uh, that would need to be disclosed as well. You know, disclosure, sunlight's the best disinfectant. So, you know, on your exam, they ask you, should something be disclosed? You should definitely uh, say yes. If we're using third-party solicitors, so federally covered investment advisors use uh, sometimes use third-party solicitors to go find them customers. And if we're using a third-party solicitor, the third-party solicitor has to give a brochure, two brochures, one brochure that explains who the third-party solicitor is, and another brochure that explains, you know, perhaps Form ADV Part 2, a brochure for the investment advisory firm. You know, and then the investment advisory firm is going to get the client to acknowledge that I've explained this relationship and that I'm not actually an employee or an investment advisor rep of that investment advisory. It's a conflict of interest because obviously I'm going to tell you I love that investment advisor because they're paying me. And then I have to tell you as a third-party solicitor, is my compensation going to be more or the same, whatever it may be? So I say, well, listen, you, the investment advisor is charging you 1%. They're going to, you know, I'm just making this up. They're going to give me that 1% as their third-party solicitor. So it's not going to cost you any additional uh, monies to access them. Or, you know, it could be different. I could say, you have to access this investment advisory firm through me, the third-party solicitor. So there's another, you know, 50 basis points, for example. Okay. I'm just making notes of what, what I want to talk about in, in 60 uh, minutes. Okay. Uh, you know, they have questions about stock or money inadvertently coming into the possession of the investment advisory firm. For example, you know, I've explained, uh, you know, my firm was called Gamma Global Investment Advisors. So I've explained the relationship I have with Schwab and I said Schwab has, does execution and custody of up for us. And so on the broker dealer side, you're a customer of Schwab and on the investment advisory side, Gamma Global Investment Advisors. And you call me and you say, hey, Dean, I just came into, you know, a half a million bucks and uh, I'd like to, you know, put it in the account and uh, let's put it to work. I go, that's wonderful. Uh, and you say, I'm sending the money in. Now, I'm expecting and looking at your Schwab account to see a half a million dollars in there. And I open today's mail and there's your check for a half a million dollars, not made out to Charles Schwab, but made out to uh, Gamma Global Investment Advisors. So remember, that has to be returned within three days. So if I inadvertently, you know, customers don't always get these relationships. So return it to the customer inadvertently within three business days, or depending on my relationship with the customer and Schwab, uh, you know, maybe I can send it to Schwab with a stamp, like for further credit to Schwab account, da, da, da. The key point, the key pivot word is inadvertently. And then the follow-up for your test is that three business days. Uh, you can't borrow money from your customers unless they're a bona fide lending institution. And you go through that normal process. So this isn't a problem if it's the bank, I'm getting a mortgage and I go through that same underwriting process uh, that everybody else would. You know, sometimes what they do on the test is can try and confuse you or cloud your mind a little bit with the lending institution and getting a loan from somebody who works at the lending institution. A different thing like mortgage broker versus, you know, mortgage, you know, lender, right? Not, you know, rocket mortgage versus somebody who works at rocket mortgage. Uh, blanket recommendations are uh, are usually uh, prohibited practice. Now, the exception would be if I'm actually tell you that all I make recommendations about is growth. But in general, blanket recommendations would be um, uh, a problem you know, because every client's situation is going to be unique. So again, the exception is if I tell you that's my specialty. You know, I say I you know I'm a growth fund manager, so I only make recommendations about growth stocks. 
I remember change in control of the investment advisory firm. So remember, the change in the uh, control of the investment advisory firm requires client consent. Very testable. You can't assign a client's uh, account investment advisory contract without their consent. So be looking for in the question change of control. Now, there's no change in control uh, that might require notification, but it wouldn't require uh, consent. Your default should be consent would be required. So if you have to err, err on saying it is a change in control, and uh, it would have to do do that. Uh, we have to give a customer statement as a minimum uh, quarterly, and uh, you know that's why a lot of firms use broker dealers because we're already prepared to do that. So in the investment advisor brochure, remember, we have a uh, form ADV part two is considered the brochure. You don't have to use the form ADV part two, but if you don't, you better make sure that brochure has everything in there that would uh, have been. Now, if I'm using the brochure to solicit, because that's what I'm doing, right? And I show up and I haven't given to you 48 hours prior to entering the contract, then you're going to have a five-day free look to terminate. So I say, hey, doctor, I know you want to get busy. I know you probably want your attorney to look that over. I just handed it to you. I get it. So I'll tell you what, since I didn't send it to you 48 hours ago, you're just now receiving it. Uh, let's get busy on this thing. Let's get this contract effective. And then you have this five-day free look where you can terminate uh, with no penalty. Uh, so we give you the uh, form ADV part two, 2A and 2B. 2A Remember, it's about the firm, and 2B is typically the personnel. And then if uh, if we have a change in that, uh, we provide the annual delivery, a summary of those changes, 120 days at the end of uh, the fiscal year in, uh, with an, you know whatever those amendments are, whatever those changes are, and then offer you a, another brochure upon request. Okay. Uh, cybersecurity and uh, data protection. So remember on your exam, written supervisory procedures. In our written supervisory procedures, we're going to have to have something about cybersecurity and data protection. You know, we're going to have to be able to protect our customers' from identity, identity theft. You know, have some red flags. Uh, talk what we're going to do on the technology front. And, and then, you know, you as an investment advisor rep are, you know, that front line of defense in terms of that. Uh, securities, you're not going to get, well, I shouldn't say that. I mean, you know, it depends on your background, how challenging this can be. But remember, about half have the exam as regular registration and half is, you know, regulatory, uh, you know, registration, regulatory half is investments. So one of the equity investments uh, I would, I think you're going to see is an American depository receipt. Remember, American depository receipts are best characterized as foreign securities that are actually have domestic wrappers, you now sold as domestic securities in the U.S. You know, it's an easy way for a customer, for us to diversify a customer with foreign securities, which we hope might have different correlation to U.S. markets. Now, uh, also on the test, you should know that an ADR is going to subject my client to currency risk, right? Because if the uh, business is conducted in the foreign currency, even though it's getting turned into dollars, we have that foreign currency uh, risk. Uh, in preferred stock, remember you have preferential treatment in two areas. And, you know, the dividend, they can't pay a dividend to common if they're in arrears to their preferred stockholders. And in liquidation, it's a senior security to common. So, you know, they always ask, you know, liquidation priority, senior to junior, Secured bonds, unsecured bonds, preferred stock common, or junior, senior, common, preferred, unsecured debt, secured debt. Now, preferred stock has an income stream. And so the dividend from a preferred stock is stated as a maximum and not a minimum. And so that means we can use discounted cash flow. When we use discounted cash flow as it applies to a stock, we call it the dividend discount model. The dividend discount model. Now there's two versions of discounted cash flow for stocks you get tested on. The dividend discount model, where we assure, assume the dividend is fixed, constant, doesn't change. So it'd be the only model appropriate for preferred stock. But in common stock, remember the dividend may actually, the board may decide to move it from 18 cents a quarter to 22 cents a quarter. And so there we could do 
uh, what's called the dividend growth model. Now, the test question would be that the dividend growth model, two test questions, can't be used with preferred stock because, you know, it doesn't, the dividend doesn't grow. And then the second follow-up question would be something like what would result in a higher value valuation, and that would be the dividend uh, growth model. Uh, I would have a general understanding of fundamental analysis uh, where we're using, you know, making decisions about the economy, the industry, the company, top down or bottom up company, industry, economics versus technical analysis, you know, where we're using uh, charts. Now, in fixed income investments, uh, I would certainly be able to do the uh, current yield, what, in, uh, what investment pays you divided by what it costs you. Uh, listen, if you're, you know, watching this the day before your exam or morning of, I would like you to know that, you know, a lot of times people who are worried about math, I mean, there's people who love math and people who hate math. And the math is not, it's mainly like, can you recognize the math? Not so much can you do it. That being said, you should be able to do current yield. What an investment pays you by what it costs you. Annual dividend for the stock and a bond, it would be the annual interest divided by what it costs you, market price. Now, you're not going to get tested on yield to maturity or yield to call, except as, you know, where is it in relationship to that? So what I mean by that is, you know, I might get a question about a bond at a premium. And, uh, you know, I have to quote, I should understand as an investment advisor rep that the lowest yield and probably most likely yield is going to be yield to call. But I wouldn't overdose on that. Um, you know, when you took your other exams, you know, you, you know, you may or may not have encountered this. But, you know, we have a measurement of volatility. And you should know that longer term bonds with lower coupons have greater volatility. So today on your exam, if you get an answer set with some bonds in it, you're going to go and pick the bond. If they ask you what has the highest volatility, be careful. Least or most will flip the question. So RTFQ, read the full question, read the full answer set. But, you know, what I would do is go to the longest maturity and then the lowest coupon. So long and low is what you need tomorrow or this afternoon, long and low. Now, the fancy word for that, you know, uh, I use a teeter totter or seesaw when I explain this uh, relationship. And maybe you watch that video. And, you know, I get people who get upset with me, particularly my bond geeks, because they go, Dean, that's not really true. You know, you've shown people this linear relationship and that's not what it is. So this is also on the test referred to as duration. So you wouldn't answer it any differently. So again, you go to over the coupon, you pick the longest coupon or longest maturity, lowest coupon, you'd say it has the higher duration, the higher duration. It's the same thing as, you know, plain English saying volatility. Now there's a word associated with this nonlinear relationship and that's called convexity. Now convexity is usually a distractor in the answer set. Right. So, you know, when they're giving you these math questions, a lot of times they're giving you distractors, but convexity is that non linear relationship. Uh, so, again, a category we're talking about is fixed income. Uh, we also have euro dollar bonds and euro bonds. Euro dollar bonds are bonds that are uh, issued overseas outside of the US, but are denominated in US dollars, and therefore you have no currency risk. Euro bonds, missing word is dollars, you would have that currency risk. Uh, commercial paper, remember commercial paper is being sold to money market fund managers and therefore, you know, not really, but you know, why lie that it helps us? Doesn't need to be registered on the Uniform Securities Act. We got commercial paper, large unsecured borrowing by corporations issued a discount, max maturity 270 days, does not need to be registered on the Uniform Securities Act. We have no negotiable jumbo CDs. Negotiable means secondary market, jumbo meaning a hundred thousand dollars and uh, you know if we're going to do a uh, discounted cash flow analysis on a mortgage security you pass through we would use average maturities on that uh pooled investments you're going to get some questions on uh, mutual funds uh, you should definitely be able to contrast open-end versus closed-end funds the biggest testable distinction is open-end funds are continually offering new shares to the public whereas closed-end funds are typically trading supply and demand. And so that means an open-end fund is going to have to, uh, you know, comply with both 33. Now, I would know that open-end funds are federally covered securities. So that means we're not going to have to register the mutual fund under the Uniform Securities Act, the open-end fund. But we are going to have prospectuses. It's a federally covered securities. Remember, the others are New York and uh, NASDAQ securities are federally covered. We talked about that basket. 
of National Securities Market Im Improvement Act. So don't have to register New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, mutual funds, or Reg D offerings with a state administrator. Um, I would definitely know what a breakpoint sale is, so be careful. RTFQ, read the full question. Breakpoints are good. A breakpoint is a quantity discount. A breakpoint sale is bad. That's a violation of uh, NASA's ethical responsibilities. I want to try and maximize my commission by avoiding uh, the breakpoint. Now, uh, you should be able to contrast a REIT with a open-end mutual fund. They're very similar in this regard. You buy both an open-end mutual fund or closed-end mutual fund, for that matter, and a REIT for professional management, diversification, and ease of ownership. Now, the distinction in the REIT is we're having a promotional, uh, excuse me, professional management, diversification, ease of ownership, not in a portfolio of securities, but in a portfolio of uh, real estate, right? So that's the major distinction, decimal distinctions. And both uh, mutual funds and REITs must pass out, pass through 90% of their net investment income. You know, most do much better, but 90%. They don't flow through losses, just, just the income. Now, the other thing you want to be able to do is contrast a open-end mutual fund with an ETF, an exchange-traded fund. An exchange-traded fund, uh, unlike an open-end fund, can be bought a margin. It's uh, trading in the secondary market. It's a little tax efficient. And, but they actually own the uh, underlying securities, the fund. So you have proportion ownership of those securities in the exchange-traded fund. Now, be careful again. That's not true in an exchange-traded note or an equity link note, the test question there is those are debt instruments. And so you have a creditor relationship with the sponsor, distributor, or underwriter. Uh, Insurance-based products, you're only going to get a couple of questions. Uh, so again, I wouldn't freak out about insurance. Again, it, it, this is for when you're coming down the back nine the day before. So you shouldn't let this 60 minutes freak you out. You know, if, you know, uh, if it was important enough, I tell you to pull over the car, you know, grab a lecture real quick. Uh, and I don't think there's anything uh, that's that important. You know, most important is your psyche. So if this isn't helping your psyche, well, then stop watching or don't watch it to begin with. All right. So first test question is you're not allowed to sell insurance as an investment or as securities, right? So that's our first kind of test question. And I would know that a traditional life insurance policy, you know, the two basics are term and whole life, and with whole life, you have some guaranteed cash value uh, for a policy loan with a policy loan. Universal life has flexible premiums. And so that means insufficient payments could cause the po uh, policy to lapse. You know, what you're hoping is that the flexible premium, you know, you're feeding the sub account or the separate account, which is basically an underlying mutual fund. Um, variable life, maybe one question on variable life. And on variable life, the guaranteed uh, uh, minimum death benefit is not guaranteed. And up to 75% of the cash value can be borrowed. Uh, variable life, uh, you can convert it to a permanent plan of life insurance within the first 24 months. If you want to switch, if it's too confusing, perhaps. Uh, I would definitely know a capital needs analysis. So you could expect a question about which of the following would be used to determine the further needs of, you know, uh, what you need in terms of insurance to replace income or whatever it is, the investment program. That's called a capital needs analysis. It's used to determine the coverage for future needs. Um, so far, that's the highest risk one I've discussed as it relates to insurance-based products. Uh, variable annuities, remember variable annuities are mutual funds with insurance wrappers. So you're funding that with after-tax money. That's your cost basis. It's going to grow tax-deferred. And then when you're 59 and a half, you could choose to, uh, you know, uh, take withdrawals from it. And if you do random withdrawals, it's going to be LIFO, last in, first out. And if you want to annuitize, the thing that will give you the largest monthly check is a um, life only. Now, we also have equity indexed annuities. And make sure today or tomorrow when you test that you know that equity indexed annuities, which uh, uh, index match the index, the reference, whatever it is, uh, have no negative reset. So again, that wouldn't be a security because you can't lose money. But the key point for your exam is no negative reset. Uh, options, uh, I would expect a answer set, long call, short call, long put, short put. Just remember, 
you know, it's if you miss the mark because of options, I'm not going to believe you. That being said, though, you know, there are they're there. And primarily, you know, you're either using them to speculate or to hedge. Now, if I have the stock position for income, I'm going to sell the option. And for protection, I'm going to buy the option. Right. So if I have a stock position, long stock position to protect it, I'm going to buy a put for income. I'm going to sell a call. And if I have a short stock position, I'm going to uh, buy a call. Uh, American style, remember, means I can exercise anytime. Uh, leaps, long-term equity appreciation, potential securities typically go out to 39 months, but in practice, uh, 30. Uh, forwards and futures. Again, you might get a question and you need to contrast futures with forwards. Forwards, you have counterparty risk. That, that kind of sucks, right? You, the farmer, have the risk that the silo doesn't pay you for your soybeans. They have the risk you don't deliver. The contract is non-standardized. It's not uh, liquid. And so that would be the futures. And then you're either going to go long or short the futures. Now you got don't have counterparty risk because there's an exchange in the middle. And you're going to use it again to speculate or hedge on prices going up or down. If you think things, the futures and soybeans are going up, you're going to go long the futures. And if you think the price of soybeans is going down, you're going to short the futures. And then you, uh, in terms of hedge, you would do whatever you're worried about. You would do in the futures market today what you're going to do in the cash market or spot market later on. So if I'm a soybean farmer, I'm worried about prices going down. I'd short the futures, hoping the short futures position will make up what I'm going to lose in the cash market. If I'm actually buying soybeans, I'm afraid the price is going up and I go long with futures. Uh, partnerships, I don't think would be a big deal, but remember there's going to be a limited partner. There's going to be a general partner. And we organize uh, hedge funds as partnerships. And so typically the general partner is the hedge fund, uh, hedge fund manager, and the fund, right? The uh, investors are limited partners. Uh, typically in a hedge fund organizes a private partnership. Uh, typically in that transaction, the fund manager is a federally covered investment advisor, but the funds are not. The funds are typically not registered either under 33 or the Funeral Farm Securities Act, whereas the managers are typically registered as, um, as uh, federally covered investment ma managers. Now, the, you know, in terms of the hedge funds, they're alternative investment. And so again, we would be looking for something that gives us different correlation in the customer's portfolio. Uh, it's a stupid, but test, but you could also use commodities for that and uh, precious metals. And they're gonna ask you on the test, what is not a precious metal? So gold is a precious metal, platinum is a precious metal, silver is a precious metal, copper is not a precious metal. Copper is not a precious metal. Now, some of the quantitative analysis on your exam, uh, again, don't freak out about quantitative analysis today or tomorrow, depending on when you're doing it. It's mainly input or output from the math, not, you know, because they're giving you a simple function calculator. So current yield, yes. Uh, tax and tax equivalent yields, yes. Remember the 100% minus the tax bracket. Multiply if it's a taxable yield. Divide if it's tax-free. You know, so if you can't remember to do, I would tell you to divide. And I have many debriefs where people say they had to use their calculator maybe once, you know, maybe twice. So I wouldn't worry too about too much about it. But to compute future value, uh, the inputs are the current amount we're investing today, the expected our earnings rate. And remember, we get more than expected. We'll get to our financial destination, that future value sooner. We get less, we'll be there later. And the time period, the time the money will be invested. So how much do we have today and what's the future value? Now, the, remember, the other version of this is present value. So present value, we're going to take the future amount we need and we're going to be, go backwards, right? The earnings rate and the time the money will be invested. So uh, future value, present value. Uh, rule of 72 can help you uh, handle some of these, what we might look at first glance like a very difficult question. So rule of 72 tells you how quick you double, right? So you divide by the rate you're going to return, and that would tell you how many years, or divide by the years, and that would tell you the rate uh, needed. The internal rate of return takes into consideration the time value of money. And again, it's uh, not practical for stocks. It's primarily going to be you know, bonds or something like that. Uh, the variable not needed to compute net present value is the inflation rate. So, you know, sometimes you're trying to, you know, they love the accept format, what's not necessary. And that's certainly uh, not 
uh, one of the things you need to uh, do that. Um, I'm just looking here. I made a note. I just wanted to tell you that, uh, you know, in a bond, the yield of maturity is equal to the internal rate of return. That's what brings the future value to the present value. Anyways, um, I would have general understanding of beta. Remember, beta one mirrors the market. Uh, I would definitely uh, know uh, that the excess of the beta is known as alpha, and that could be positive or negative. Uh, I would definitely know negative correlation or investments that go different directions. You know, positive correlation goes the same way. And if we're trying to diversify, we would want to have negative correlation. So, you know, I, the example I always use is, you know, if I already have Home Depot in your portfolio, you know, why put Lowe's in there? Because, you know, essentially they have a very, uh, well, not perfect positive correlation, but pretty close. That doesn't mean I don't want to load up on the home improvement sector. We're just talking about as it relates to quantitative analysis. So what I would want to put in the portfolio is something that has a negative uh, correlation. Uh, types of risk, you're certainly going to get tested on systematic risk, the tendency of securities prices to move together versus non-systematic risk, you know, also known as selection risk. You definitely need to know that selection risk can be mitigated through diversification. And the easiest way for most folks to do that is in a mutual fund. Uh, you should know that you have a mitigated systematic or market risk that tend to securities prices move together. Risk prevails despite your diversification. You should definitely know about interest rate risk. Interest rates go up. You know, uh, bond that fixed income investment vehicles go down. Uh, inflation or purchasing power risk, you should know two things. Uh, a good thing that keeps pace with inflation. So as an investment advisor representative, if I'm worried about inflation, what I might put in your portfolio to keep pace, not beat, keep pace is a tip, a treasury inflation protected security. And if I want to beat inflation, because fixed income investment vehicles would be not appropriate, would be common stock, common stock. Uh, we have test question legislative risk. What Congress giveth, Congress can taketh away. So for example, the dividend exclusion ratio used to be 70%. It used to be that a dividend of one corporation paid to another corporation was 70% tax excludable. And then Congress changed it to 50% of a dividend of one corporation paid to another corporation is tax excludable. That's legislative risk uh, realized, right? So if you're counting on the 70% and now they change it, uh, that would be legislative risk. Uh, there are other ones that get into the test. Liquidity risk, don't uh, buy a partnership. Currency risk on the ADR. Uh, opportunity costs is certainly there. You know, uh, what am I giving up in what investment A for investment B? If investment A is paying me uh, 20% and I buy one that pays 10, there's a 10% opportunity cost. All right, uh, types of clients you have as an investment advisor representative. Uh, the types of clients you have as an investment advisor representative could be a, a, a joint tenant with rights of survivorship account, where both parties own 100% of the account. And the decedent share goes to the uh, surviving party. Uh, we could have uh, tenants in common, where there is a fractional interest, and the decedent's share uh, goes to their estate or beneficiary. Now, you can't use transfer on death with the uh, tenant and common account, right? So, um, well, the point, let me re just rephrase that. Um, you, you know, t transfer on death avoids probate. So, you know, that's what we're trying to say. So let me just rephrase that as you were. <laughs> so I don't think they're going to get in the weeds like that. Just want to, you know, the difference between the two and then transfer uh, on death avoids uh, probate. All right, tenancy uh, by the entirety is only for married couples. And that's typically used in uh, real estate. If we're going to get a power of attorney on the account, uh, the power of trading authorization could be limited where I only can trade your account. It could be full, full where I can trade your account and withdraw monies and securities. Uh, durable would survive your incapacitation and all power of attorney cease upon death. Uh, the grantor of a trust can be the uh, trustee and the beneficiary. And then uh, uh, really kind of an odd term, I, I told you, sometimes a challenge 
is just the language, but uh, the remainder man, if you hear that term on your exam tomorrow or this afternoon, is the individual who will receive the principle of a trust when the final distribution takes place. Last one standing per se, <laughs> you know. Uh, per stirpes is the term used to describe the way the assets are distributed to the uh, descendants. And uh, you as an investment advisor representative currently can be appointed as a trustee to handle the account. There are some proposed changes out there, but you know, the Uniform Securities Act, the template which you're being tested on takes forever. So just know, yeah, you could be. Uh, dying without a will is called dying in test date. And then the administrator uh, will decide who the executor or executress is. And remember the executor or executress of the estates of a due share, their transactions are exempt under the Uniform Securities Act. Uh, client profile. So we want to do a client balance sheet, a picture in time for the client. And, you know, that would be the assets minus liabilities equals net worth. Now, sometimes what they'll do on the test is ask you what would or would not be on the balance sheet. You know, so you're looking for a number, something that's a number goes on there, something that is not, uh, does not. Um, I'd also have a, a general understanding of the income statement where we have the income of the client, right? And we're hoping we're going to find some money that perhaps we can do some dollar cost averaging with, you know, that's what, you know, get them, them to give us fixed dollars invested regularly, so to speak. Uh, portfolio management style. So we might have growth. And remember on the, your exam, you would associate a growth portfolio or stocks in a growth portfolio with uh, stocks that have higher uh, price to book ratios, higher price to earnings ratios, and you're expecting earnings momentum. Those earnings will go up. And that's why you can justify the higher price to earnings ratio, the higher multiple. Uh, you know, it would be kind of a Sesame Street trick, like recognize one of these things is not like the other kind of a question. You know, growth stocks typically don't pay dividends or have very low dividends. So we would associate that with a low dividend payout ratio. Uh, value, if on the other hand, I'm a value investor, I'd be looking for stocks that are cheaper, trading at lower PEs, lower price to books, and would typically have a higher dividend payout ratio or higher uh, dividend yields. You know, if I'm a contrarian, I'm doing the opposite of what other people are doing. You know, the way Mr. Buffett says is he buys into fear and he sells into greed. Uh, we're typically going to re rebalance the portfolio back to whatever our asset allocation percentages are. Uh, another thing we can do in our portfolio to reduce inflationary risk is buy tangible assets. We talked about that. Uh, you're going to get tested on modern portfolio theory. Not, you know, theory isn't true, just a way of explaining things. The more the theory that can explain, the better it is. So under modern portfolio theory, the efficient portfolio is the one that gives us the greatest return given the amount of risk we're willing to take. And all of those portfolio together is called, a collection of efficient portfolios is called the efficient frontier, right? So under that, we have what's called the, the uh, you know, what helps us inform modern portfolio theory is the capital market line and that's uh, one of the risk statistics that is the standard deviation. You don't need the alpha to know how to calculate it. It's just the amount of return you're expecting given the risk you're taking. That's called the capital market line. All right. uh, efficient market, there's three of them, right? And hypothesis. Again, hypothesis isn't true either, but the hypothesis, we have weak, strong, or uh, weak, semi-strong, strong. So in the efficient market hypothesis, uh, under the weak form of this, technical analysis is no good, meaning fundamental maybe. Uh, Semi-strong, neither technical or fundamental analysis works. And the strongest form would be the markets are totally efficient, efficient, so nothing works. And in which case you should buy an index fund. Um, sometimes we refer to that as uh, a random walk. Uh, dollar cost averaging we talked about, right? That's another strategy where we have fixed dollars invested regularly. We end up with a lower average cost than those of the underlying shares. Doesn't guarantee a profit. And if we've been acquiring securities over different time frames and we're not selling them all, we could do average cost if we're doing it all. We could do share identification. But remember, the IRS imposes FIFO, first in, first out. All right, let's talk about some tax considerations. Uh, the distributable net income of a trust includes the uh, dividends from the stock in the portfolio 
and the interest uh, from the uh, bonds in the portfolio. Uh, it doesn't uh, include capital gains that are reinvested in the corpus or the corpus is land for the body of the bond. Uh, we have generation skipping trusts that continues to pay more than one generation. You know, skips, the, for example, the children goes to the grandchildren. Uh, we have, uh, in terms of uh, tax considerations, we uh, definitely get tested on business structures. And we have business structures like uh, sole proprietorships, uh, LLCs, partnerships, S-Corps, C-Corps. Uh, I would know C-Corp has retained earnings, no flow through. Yeah, I would know the others have flow through. And you could expect a question about a family business, husband and wife, who are general partners, and why would they want to form an LLC? And it would be because general partners have unlimited liability. Managing members do not of an LLC. I would know an S-Corp has a maximum of 100 non-alien shareholders. Uh, I would know sole proprietorship is the easiest business structure to form and dissolve. And um, uh, definitely would know that. Uh, it, it's sad. But true, I don't know why they want to kill grandmas on your exam. But there's two scenarios on the exam to be aware of. You know, one is where there's a gift of securities. So let's say a grandmother gives her granddaughter a gift of securities. And then the test question, the answer is the granddaughter assumes the grandma's cost base. So RTFQ, read the question. The other version of this question is grandma dies. And if grandma dies, it doesn't have to be grandma, maybe you get somebody else. But if they die, remember, there's going to be a step up in that uh, cost basis. Okay, I just made me check my notes here. We're coming up on the hour. So, you know, this is a three, four day class and we're trying to give you an overview in 60 minutes. So kind of challenging. Uh, we're trying to hit the high spots, just kind of get you in the flow of your actual exam. Uh, trading securities, I wouldn't see, I think to see a whole lot of uh, trading securities, but I would know, remember that uh, we margin account is trading on leverage. We kind of talked about that a little earlier, um, but I would know uh, when we're trading, we're either trading in an auction order driven market where, you know, they're matching buyers and sellers, for example, uh, uh, New York Stock Exchange. And when we're trading over the counter where there's market makers or dealer principals. And so, you know, if I work at a Goldman Sachs, for example, I say we're a broker dealer, and in some transactions, uh, Goldman Sachs will be in, acting in its broker agency capacity on your behalf, getting the security elsewhere and charging you a commission. In other transactions you do with that Goldman Sachs, we'll be acting our dealer principal capacity, trading against you, charging a markup or markdown. Markdown bid when we buy it into our inventory, mark up when we sell it out of our inventory. Now, what is really testable is that that has to be disclosed. That's called capacity. And that will be disclosed on the confirmation of a broker dealer to a customer, what capacity they acted. And we can never act as both a broker and a dealer in the same trade. Makes sense. How could I act as your agent in negotiations with myself about a markup or a markdown? So that's called capacity. Now, in a confirmation that tells you we acted as an agent, we don't have to disclose on the confirmation the counterparty, the other side of the trade, but it's available upon request. So in the Robinhood, if you do a trade with Robinhood and He's, they're gonna. They only act an agency. So I call and say, "Who's the other side?" Yeah, yeah. They say Citadel Securities. That's the uh, market maker. And maybe an order, uh, market order, limit order question. Uh, stop order about stopping losses. Right. Uh, not a big deal. Uh, performance measures. We talked about being able to calculate current yield. Total return is the income stream plus the price appreciation. You now the only way you can make money in an investment is income stream and or price appreciation. So no income stream, it's just going to be price appreciation. But that would be in a stock, for example, the annual dividend or the interest on the bond, you know, plus or minus, you know, the, the gain or loss. Annualized return. So if I get 10% uh, and a quarter, I times it by four, that would be a 40% annualized return. After tax return is after we pay our taxes. Uh, real rate of return, very testable, is adjusted for inflation. So what they sometimes do on the test is sell your client got a 5% uh, return, inflation was eight, and you would say a negative three real rate of return. You're just netting the inflation rate. Uh, we talked about the yield maturity of a bond is the uh, bond's internal rate of return. Uh, sharp ratio, we haven't talked about that. 
Uh, sharp ratio is a measurement of risk. I'm not going to make you do anything. Uh, you know, it's based on a risk free rate of return, but a higher sharp ratio is uh, better. It means I got more return taking uh, less risk. Uh, market caps, benchmarks, very testable. So you should definitely know a small cap, the index or benchmark is going to be the Russell 2000. For a large cap, it's going to be the S&P 500. Uh, I would know two other indexes. I would know the Dow Jones Industrial Average is price weighted. It's the only one that is. And I would know the Wilshire 5000 is a index about the total stock market. Uh, retirement plans and custodial accounts. Uh, I would know that a uh, usually for most of them, you can choose to draw down at 59 and a half. If you do so early or uh, early, 10% penalty. Uh, I would know that if you take physical possession, they have to have it back in the appropriate spot within 60 days. I would know the uh, required minimum distributions are at 72, unless it's a Roth, in which case there is no required minimum distributions. I would know that an employee of a 403B or 501C, an employee of an educational uh, institution or an employee of a nonprofit can uh, have a tax sheltered annuity, a tax sheltered annuity. Uh, I would know ERISA. ERISA stands for Every Ridiculous Idea Since Adam. I'm joking. ERISA stands for uh, Uniform, or excuse me, Employee Retirement Income Security Act. And so in the uh, under ERISA, we have two basic types of plans. We have a defined benefit plan where the employer assumes the investment risk. And we have a uh, defined contribution where the employee assumes the investment risk. Uh, they're going to have to manage that according to the Uniform Prudent Investors Act. And one thing that's testable is that it's not required, but they may have the retire the pension plan, an investment policy statement that spells out the portfolio's investment objectives and philosophy, their measure of uh, performance measurement, the, how they're going to the methods they're going to be using to do that, uh, determination of their future cash flow needs to determine whether they have an unfunded or overfunded pension plan. Uh, the investment parameters follow, not individual securities, right? Uh, it doesn't uh, include the investment policy statement, does not include the summary plan description that's required by the Department of Labor. So those are different documents. The investment policy statement is different than the summary plan uh, description that's required by the Department of Labor. Remember, the investment policy statement is recommended, but not mandatory. Uh, I, on your exam, would be able to contrast a Coverdale with a 529. And, you know, almost always on your exam, what they're asking you is to come up with the answer that the 529 is more flexible and therefore going to be better for our client's portfolio. I'm just telling you what the test is assuming. So again, we're just doing the 60 minute deal. We're not, you know, doing a whole lecture on this, if, you know, too late. Right? So um, I'm just telling you that that's the one that uh, you should know. So the maximum contributions to a 529 are much higher than a Coverdale. For example, you can front it for five years. So um, the uh, 529 is considered a municipal security. I wouldn't worry about that. Uh, the educational, the Coverdale, the educational IRA, ESA, educational savings account, uh, has an income limitations, mean test, the 529 does not. So as I'm just saying, the 529 is basically uh, the winner, right? Uh, custodial accounts. We have Uniform Gift to Minors Act. We have Uniform Transfer to Minors Act. Uh, again, testable, one custodian, one minor per account. With the Uniform Gift to Minors Act, you can stipulate up, excuse me, with the Uniform Gift to Minors Act, we re-register at age of majority, 18 or 21, depending on the state. Uh, Uniform Transfer to Minors Act, we can stipulate up to the age 25. Uh, one minor, one custodian. You get a multiple donors, but only one minor, one custodian per account. The kids tax ID goes on the account and there is no margin allowed, no leverage allowed. Uh, let's see, health savings accounts. These are tax deductible contributions for your uh, medical expenses. Uh, your individuals, the employer can both contribute and to use a health savings account testable, you have to have a high deductible uh, health plan. Okay, I see that uh, you know, we, we did accomplish this in 60 minutes. So uh, it might take me a while to timestamp it, 
uh, in our video descriptions, I usually timestamp it. So, you know, for example, you freak out and you just have a thing you're trying to look and see how important it is. You can go to the video description and uh, find it there. Um, uh, like I say, these these have been popular. We'll, we'll, we'll see if they continue to be popular. <laughs> you know? So part of me is kind of like, yeah, I'm, I'm not so sure of it. You know, the, the, the lectures that you guys come up with your own and suggest are no surprise more popular than the ones I think are what I like doing, which is narrative, narrative lectures. But oh, well, remember inch by inch. This exam is the cinch yard by yard. Your exam is hard. Setting you good test fives. I hope uh, this afternoon, tomorrow, you get the, uh, you make your mark and you get the P, you get the pass. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.